Hi everybody, Andy here. Just before we start this week's show, wanted to announce our special guest. This one is really exciting, guys. Uh, our, our special guest this week is none other than David Mitchell. That's right. If you haven't heard of David Mitchell, you haven't seen any British comedy recently because he's been in absolutely everything. Of course, Peep Show, Upstart Crow, Would I Lie to You, The Unbelievable Truth every single panel show going and he's here he's on fish this week david is here partly because he has as you are about to hear in the show a new book out and it is a fantastic book i genuinely finished it this morning and i loved it it's called unruly it's a history book it's a history of england's kings and queens it goes all the way from king arthur fictional to queen elizabeth I, not fictional and it is so funny and yet you also are being educated all the way along the way it's been described as horrible history for grown-ups and that's exactly what it's like you'll laugh you'll learn it's got that classic mitchell wit all the way through it's absolutely fantastic there are lengthy digressions about things like where you can get a nice coffee in oxford uh, or the james bond films all of that it's so good and it's not even just me saying this it has already been a number one sunday times bestseller so if you have a history fan in your life who you think would like a laugh as well this is a perfect present also, if you'd like even more David Mitchell in your life after this episode, his new show Outsiders has just started its third series. That's on Dave. It's a kind of outdoor challenge survival show hosted by David. And the guests this series include Alan Davies of QI and, of course, former Fish guest. So that's it from me. I'll stop wanging on now. Hope you enjoy this episode. We really enjoyed recording it. On with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray and David Mitchell and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, that is David. Well, my fact is that King Stephen owed his throne to food poisoning. <laughs> or, or, you know, the shits. Right. <laughs> yeah. I haven't asked about swearing. How much? You're allowed. Go yeah, for it. Just, well, that's mm. fucking great. <laughs> uh, yes. So to diarrhea, probably okay. oh. caused by food poisoning. Okay. Well, previous king, previous king's diarrhea, not his, not not his own. His <laughs> own. His <laughs> own. Wait, not a previous king's diarrhea. What? And so no. people saw him shit himself and thought this man must be king. <laughs> No. Oh, no, no, it didn't go like that. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of diarrhoea back then. It, wasn't, um, it was, you know, there's, there's a lot now. Um, it's yeah. one of the ways you can empathise for people in the past. Mm. They, too, had liquid shits, but more often died of them. You know, King right. John shat himself to death. Oh. Henry V shat himself to death. So you've got a good king and a bad king there, both mm. dying of dysentery. But uh, King Stephen didn't have dysentery. It was a, more of a short-term thing. I don't know if it was a bug or something yet. And he certainly he didn't know um, but uh, because he got diarrhea he got off a ship and the ship he got um. off was the white ship it was state-of-the-art lovely craft in Barfleur Harbour and uh, all of the most important young people of the reign the the in crowd were on this ship and they were about to sail to England but King uh, the not yet King Stephen <laughs> Stephen of Blois was on it and he got diarrhea and he got off it to go into Barfleur and relax on a privy and uh, <laughs> the ship sailed without him and sank and wow. everyone on board oh, died wow. apart from a butcher oh. um, uh, who, who then he survived, but that's that's the the last. Then he's lost. To he went on, presumably <laughs> being a butcher, and then and then died. He had a good anecdote throughout was his it, life. Was he it? absolutely had a good anecdote. Did uh, he survive because of the butchery? Was that? But as in, does history relate whether he clung to some some of the meat? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it, I, it wasn't the buoyancy of pork chops that saved him. Uh, was it, it him who provided the meal that provided the diarrhea for uh, the future king? I don't think oh, so. Great. I'm I'm not mm. clear. As 
as to why there was a butcher on board, but ships have, <laughs> yeah. like, they have, they you know, must have you, livestock. Well, if you get on a cruise ship, they've got, you know, a swimming pool and a casino. So, yeah. you know, I don't think this ship had that. But, um, but you know, they, they had some, uh, they might not have had livestock because they're only going across the channel, but they will have <laughs> had food. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any connection. <laughs> there's no suggestion that it was his meat that he retailed that caused Stephen, King Stevens. Right. Uh, not You're yet right. King Stevens. So I can't help calling him King Stephen. He's not King Stephen yet. It's like it's Prince not, Charles you know. calling him King Charles. It's impossible to get into your head. Yes. Or it is for me anyway. Yeah. I've managed. I'm, I'm now saying King Prince Charles. I, yeah. Which is a way of easing myself into it. And eventually I'd be able to drop the prince. I was yeah. saying it two years previous just, <laughs> just, just to make sure I was yeah, no, running with it. This ship though, it does. Yeah. Sound, it sounds amazing. As in it was... Obviously, state of the art, but I mean, everyone who was anyone was on one ship at one time, which I presume was thought of as a, being fine. I mean, it clearly wasn't fine. But yeah, because like, is it like the royal family aren't really supposed to be on the same airplane or I something? Heard that is that right? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. But the yeah. heir, the real heir to the throne, was on that ship. It was on right? That's the key thing. Yes, yeah. that the real heir to the throne was on it. The king ah. at the time, King Henry the First, he wasn't on it. Mm. He was on a, a less snazzy ship with older important people, <laughs> but the younger, cool important people, including William Atheling, the heir to the throne, mm. they were all on the white ship and they all died because obviously the butcher wasn't part of that team he was, he was, he was staff uh, the, and so the only survivor was one of the staff Amazing. which I'm sure at the time they thought was absolutely the wrong way round well, one of the other staff I've, re- I've read that one of the other staff the ship's captain yeah. also survived the initial shipwreck came to the surface heard that the heir to the throne William Atheling had drowned and then just decided to drown Himself. The only person who could possibly have told us that story is the butcher. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is, you're right. <laughs> it feels like as the anecdote's gone on, he's kind of added yeah. little bits to it. <laughs> obviously, that's you'd be if you were the captain's fact. That's a very positive anecdote for the butcher <laughs> to say. And the thing is, obviously, the butcher. We don't know what happened to him, other than he didn't die in that shipwreck. Probably murdered the captain, is what I would think. Well, yeah. Possibly, um, and maybe he, he made a hole in the ship. But the thing is, he didn't even get a book deal out of it, which yeah. just shows you what. Pre- Primitive times these were, because mm. nowadays that would have been he yeah. would have been on the gravy yeah. train for life. Yeah. 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 What a ship show! Something like that. Yeah. 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 Really yeah. Yeah. Lovely. So, what year are we talking here? Eleven twenty. Eleven twenty. Okay, yeah. so that's ages ago. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> genuinely didn't even know we had proper ships crossing the channel at that point. Uh, like commercial you must trips. have guessed because <laughs> ten sixty six quite famously. How do you think they got here? A lot get across the channel. <laughs> not a swimming operation. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I had, I had the whole lifeguard, swimming pool, casino thing in my head. Oh, see, you. No. Yeah, yeah, so I don't I was... think they hadn't bought tickets. It, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't a scheduled cross. I think it was absolutely just. It was commissioned for the uh, right, for the, just for the posh people okay. to go across because they they were having a very nice time at the point. Henry I had just won a small war against the King of France. William Atheling had been confirmed as the heir to the Dukedom of Normandy. At that point, the King of England was also Duke of Normandy and he was running this cross-channel regime. And so they've shored up their position on the continent in this sort of weird situation where the King of France is king in Normandy, but not in control of it. Uh, And the, the Duke of Normandy runs Normandy, but has to sort of pay lip service to the feudal seniority of the King of France. But that's all been lined up for William Atheling. The King of France is back in his box. Uh, He didn't live in a box. (laughs) There there will have been French kings who lived in boxes. There was a French king who thought he was made out of glass. But uh, but this one, I think, was sort of comparatively normal. (laughs) So Henry I, very happy. Let's all go back to England, this other country we own, and Mm. hang out there for a bit. So it was a, a happy day, very successful period of Henry I's reign. And then it was a bit like a sort of mega som in that the heirs to the whole ruling class just died in one go. Is it true that they were all drunk as well? I read that. Yes. That mm, basically, yeah. they decided to get the boats across at night time. Yeah. We're not sure why, but it might have been just so they oh. could get pissed in the meantime. Right. And apparently, everyone on board was absolutely shit-faced, oh. and that could have been one of the reasons that they crashed. That's interesting. Yeah. It seems quite likely to be one of the reasons, <laughs> doesn't it? Because they were obviously quite... I mean, in those days, there were more shipwrecks than there are now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it wasn't a done deal crossing the channel, but I don't think the weather was bad. Mm. They, people were nipping back and forth 
forth all the time. But yeah, William Atheling essentially declared it a party boat mm. and said, we're all going to have a drink. And, he, you know, not to be a snob, he very much included the, the staff, the crew, the butcher and crucially right. the people driving the ship <laughs> as they didn't call it then. Yes. So one set of people they didn't include was the priests. So usually the priests would bless the ship before it set off. Oh, yeah. uh, because it was a party boat, they decided to dis- dismiss the priests. Oh. And so they didn't get blessed. Right. And so later on, some people said that may have been the reason that they crashed. Yeah. That's, do you think that's the reason they crashed? <laughs> I'm only reporting what some people said. That was, I mean, that sounds tremendously convenient. <laughs> the prevailing religious ethos of the time. Oh, yeah. Because they blamed everything on yeah. religion. Because they, obviously they lived in baffling times where they didn't understand much of what was happening happening to them so they were were very keen in the middle ages to say it's not that we're you know tiny little creatures in a universe of which we have no comprehension it's that we didn't pray enough (laughs) so there was something we could have done yes yeah and and uh, I think it probably made living in the middle ages a little bit more relaxing than it otherwise would have been Uh, anyway the white ship uh, yeah sank and uh, the future king Stephen is probably equally uncomfortable but in a way with fewer long-term consequences to his survival was he seen as someone who is you know useful did they look at him and go okay at least we've got someone who might be a good king or was he a sort of oh dear with stephen just no, stephen no no it was henry the first who they say after the white ship disaster he never smiled again mm, and i right. don't know how they know but i'm not going to call them liars uh, but he was very very upset and he was upset in two ways his obviously his beloved son was dead uh, Uh, Lots of other people's beloved sons were dead. But crucially, his plan for the succession of the English crown uh, is in absolute ruins. Uh, Because he's had lots of children, Henry I, but only two of them with his wife. Hmm. And the two with his wife are William Atheling, who drowns, and Matilda, who uh, goes Told off dreadful to... lies. No, <laughs> <laughs> she is uh, she is the former wife the, of the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, okay. as it wasn't then called, but the Emperor <laughs> would be the expression. So she went around calling herself Empress Matilda right. with some justification, and he quickly marries someone else to try and get a new son going because they didn't like the idea of women ruling then. Uh, totally fails to beget any children with his new wife, even though he's begat children all <laughs> over the place, and she begets a load after he's dead. So, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> his sperm and her eggs, they don't make a good team. Uh, probably because he's so desperately trying to beget an heir. And it's just the whole begetting vibe is so unromantic, <laughs> mm, yeah. isn't it? It's just, um, so anyway, so he doesn't get any more legitimate children before he dies. So he's stuck with only Matilda. And he says, OK, well, the only way my bloodline can continue, which is the main thing. So he makes everyone say, look, I know it's, I've only got a daughter and everyone thinks women shouldn't be in charge of things because this is the past and it's sexist. I'm quoting him directly. <laughs> uh, but please. Please come on so that my DNA can carry on please say that she can be the next king effectively ruler queen and everyone goes your majesty of course for you anything and twice all of the big shots of the reign all of the men that didn't ask the women which is perhaps a sign that this is a problematic strategy for the age (laughs) but nevertheless all of the men go we absolutely as soon as you're dead your majesty she's in charge and we'll absolutely do everything she says like we did to you and they all swear including Stephen of Blois and Henry goes to his grave thinking maybe this will be okay but as soon as he dies everyone's more thinking well you can't have a woman in charge that's Mm. either because they themselves think a woman couldn't be in charge or because they think well i'm quite woke i think it'd be fine for a woman to be in charge but other people won't accept it Mm. but uh, yes so then please can (laughs) matilda be uh, the next queen yes of course your majesty he dies no she can't stephen runs to london gets himself crowned And he's King Stephen. Well, the other thing is that Henry I's death was also due to food poisoning, we think, right? Oh, yeah. So it's like a double food poisoning thing because he famously died of a surfeit of lampreys, I think. That's what we're always taught in school. Uh But there's been a few recent studies, uh, one by Matthew D. (laughs) Turner in 2023, who reckons that he died of listeria. 
Mm. possibly from the lampreys or possibly from something else yet with the lampreys but also perhaps it would have made him confused just as he was about to die because that's what happens with this illness and there is a story that on his deathbed he actually told some of these lords oh no matilda i've changed my mind i don't think matilda should be queen after all i think stephen should be king right and yeah (laughs) my my feeling is that that's not so much the effect of the listeria (laughs) but the effect of those people who are in stephen's camp lying about what the (laughs) so that's that's also who can say uh, yeah yeah. Uh, but yes no i'd heard that it was yes it wasn't like surfeit of lampreys rather unfair of him right if he'd have Mm. you could have two fewer lampreys you'd have been fine (laughs) Uh, no it's just that the lampreys he had or as you say something that went with them the the Mm. chips or something uh that that, yes they'd been badly prepared apparently it's quite difficult to prepare lampreys in a way that that doesn't kill you yeah. and on, the, on this occasion they hadn't bothered they're kind of like the blowfish of the of Is the that day right? they yeah. call that they can they can be they can really do a number on you um, you never see them on do? menus anymore no that's yeah. why it's so I risky yeah, yeah, yeah. i went to a restaurant once that only did a uh, blowfish oh yeah my, only yeah, yeah. oh <laughs> my no, wife, thank you Look it at was the menu. in Osaka, i think or somewhere like that and my wife wanted to try blowfish and i was oh. i'd had a bit of food poison and didn't really want it mm-hmm. so we went to this place that sold blowfish and the menu it was like pictures on the menu yeah and so we looked at them all and it was like blowfish 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 <laughs> and then there was some chicken nuggets and i'm like oh thank god i'll have the chicken nuggets you can have the blowfish and then we went in they sat us down we ordered our sake or whatever and i said in english hoping that they'd speak it, i said i'll have the chicken and they said oh no that's uh, blowfish go dance <laughs> And it was deep fried blowfish gonads. Wow. Um, so <laughs> we left. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I was going to eat blowfish, which I'm not, I'm not sure I'd want to eat it in the sort of place where they show pictures of the food. <laughs> yeah. The ones where they show a photo almost to yeah. prove that they can cook at all and not learn. A lot of the places, as they go for their Michelin star, they decide that the, the photos need to, to be excised. <laughs> Oh, oh. Um, Henry, yeah. the King Henry, he has, I think, the most Baroque afterlife of any English king oh, yeah. I've okay. read about. I mean, so d- he dies in he's in he's in France, isn't he? At the, the hunting yes. lodge where he has the lampreys and then and then dies. Yeah. And um, he instructed he'd be taken to Reading uh, just before he died because he'd founded an abbey there. <laughs> he'd always but wanted to go always, to Reading. He he? <laughs> Loves his biscuits. It was nearish Legoland or the site of the future <laughs> Legoland. So he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> He'd founded a big abbey in Reading, so he thought, right, I'll go there. So, but he, he was taken to Rouen, his body, so after he dies, he was taken to Rouen and embalmed there. But not all of him, because his, his heart, his bowels, his brains, his eyes and his tongue were removed uh, and buried in Normandy at a different uh, monastery or abbey or whatever it was. Okay. And then he was embalmed and he was rubbed with salt and then he was put in a bag made of ox hides for the journey, so he's, you know, he'll hopefully get to Reading in a decent state. Right. I mean, but, you've removed his heart, his eyes, well, his whatever. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to look lovely. No, no. Well, he's in a bag, so that's fine. He's in a bag made yeah. of oxide. Don't so open the bag. <laughs> well, that's the thing. They get to the coast. They get... Worst pinata. <laughs> they get to the coast and the boat is then delayed by four weeks due to bad weather, and oh, everyone's no. looking at the bag and thinking, oh no. And it's and the bag, I think, starts to leak. Oh, and no. Sort of very... Pungent. Body juice, I heard about this it's pun- very very pungent um stuff there is a, i think a story i think this is about him that the man who was ordered to remove his brain there was such a bad aroma about the brain because of how he died that the man ordered to remove the brain also died <laughs> of smell <laughs> of right? smell of brain smell. died of smell yeah yeah oh, i read that that al- was albeit 40 years later so <laughs> they, they associate and in a carriage accident yeah, yeah but it was <laughs> but he was definitely that yeah. smell. he was never the same again <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean wow. what a what an afterlife what, you know? a, what a shame that the elizabeth line wasn't named after him because that terminates in Reading. That would have been a oh, beautiful yeah. tribute. Yeah. The King maybe, and, it's, and it's subterranean as well, so maybe it literally comes up against his skull. Yeah. Mm. And that's that's wow. used as to save money, keep it <laughs> under fifty billion. They actually use some of the the heft of former King Henry to slow the trains down. Yeah. Oxide buffers, yeah. yeah. Well, right. What I should say though, the consequence of Stephen's food poisoning and then him being declared king, and then him being not very good at being king and Matilda Henry's daughter 
being extremely pissed off to have been passed over mm. is that she she doesn't take it lying down and she tries with all her might to wrest the throne from Stephen mm. and there is a huge civil war called the anarchy in a, in a way that historians now say it shouldn't be called the anarchy because <laughs> that in some way reduces it <laughs> what you should just do is spend thousands and thousands of words describing it minutely rather than giving it a label um, it but these are obviously historians are not not familiar with the concept of language uh, but anyway I'm going to call it the anarchy it does sound quite an anarchic like an 18 years of a war it was quite it was quite anarchic yeah. yes but also equally you could take a little bit of it and it was quite calm off at night time for example so it's very very reductive of you to use that word um uh, so, you know, for example, I think it's very bad to call an apple an apple. What you want is a printout of every individual cell. And that's actually a, b a better way of describing it. Uh, anyway, this anarchy happened and was awful. And Matilda nearly got to be the, the queen. At one point, she was about to be crowned. But then the people in London got cross and she had to run away. And then at another point, she was under siege in Oxford Castle and she ran away through the snow. It was quite exciting. Mm. But eventually, she gave up and went back to Normandy, which by then her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou, had wrested from Stephen. But then her son does inherit the throne because Stephen's regime essentially uh, right. peters out. Right. So they do a deal. Matilda's son, Henry, becomes Henry II, Plantagenet, named after his father, Geoffrey. Ah, yeah. Um, cool. And then you, have, then you have quite ordered succession for quite a long time. It's all, it's all in the first four... You know the rhyme of all the kings and queens of England? Uh -huh. It's yeah. Willy, Willy, Harry, Stee. It's yeah. all. It's, this is all the Harry Stee bit, right? Yeah. It's this, just, just that bit. Wow. This is Harry Stee. Um, I was uh, just jumping a few Henrys ahead. Henry yeah. the Eighth. I was looking okay. up food because uh, I thought oh, royal meals sound a bit odd, and I discovered that he used to serve this meal called cockentrice or cockentrice. Okay. Have you heard of this? No. So it was oh. a pig sewn uh, to another animal, and he pitched it as a mythical beast, and he would say, "This is a, this is a oh, mythical it's like beast." Got wings from of a bird. Is I, I, th I think it came in a few different right. permutations. I think it always usually had a pig on the front. It's a chicken, but with the testicles of a blowfish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I just love that, that Henry VIII would just present, you know, what was effectively so, the old version of a yeti at the table for So he's sort of saying, not only have I discovered a mythical beast, I've killed it and we're going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. and, it and it's the, the last one, sadly. <laughs> but there it is. You look at it now, and then what do you fancy? A bit of wing? And they're like, oh, it tastes a bit like chicken. It's weird how everything tastes a bit like chicken, isn't it? <laughs> My bit tastes like pork. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about the, the cock and dry. It's so full of flavours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bottom's got chocolate in it. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Hi everyone, we'd like to let you know that this week was sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs! That's right, we certainly are. Now, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. Whether you're selling uh, slow berries to people who want to make their own slow gin at home. <laughs> genuinely go through my recent purchases and that's what I had. Um, you want to be certain you've got the best possible candidates for your job. And that is why LinkedIn Jobs is so good because you can find the right people for your team, you can find it faster, and post a job for free if you do it through us. Absolutely. It is really difficult to find the right people, and the good thing is that so many people are on LinkedIn that if you're looking for the best, most qualified candidates, they're almost certain to be on there. And like Andy says, if you post through us, you can post your job for free. So the way you do that is you go to LinkedIn, L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N, you know how to spell LinkedIn, LinkedIn.com <laughs> slash fish, and like I say, you can post your job for free. That's right. Whether you're recruiting a slow picker, a slow packer, a slow dispatcher, you can find the right person for your business. So go to linkedin.com slash fish and post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. On with the podcast. On with the show. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is... Andy. My fact is that sea turtles have been going to the same restaurant for 3,000 years. Blowfish mm. served? <laughs> yeah, it's only blowfish. 
Yeah, that's it's nice. A, you find a thing you like. Nice. And... Yeah, <laughs> just eat that forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is about green sea turtles. It's a n- uh, new study uh, from the universities of Groningen, Exeter, York, Copenhagen, and the Society for the Protection of Turtles. They've all teamed up. <laughs> so they're quite pro-turtles. <laughs> Very pro-turtles. <laughs> no, the, the Society for the Eradication of Turtles didn't, didn't get a look no, at. Absolutely that's not. That's quite... I'm not sure if that's appropriate balance. <laughs> <laughs> if this was on the BBC, you'd have to have one person yeah. on the show going, yeah. I fucking hate turtles. Yeah. So they're a right pain. <laughs> Eating a flipper, yeah. yeah. People, um, you know, are, <laughs> Americans use the same words they do for tortoises. Yeah. I mean, it's just confusing. Let's just have one. We I don't mean, need the aquatic version of those shell people. I've been trying to book a table at that restaurant for months now. <laughs> yeah. Always um, by the window. Party yeah. of eight turtles. <laughs> Restaurant is such a is such a way of putting it, but basically it's it's a huge m- meadow of seagrass off North Africa, and mm. and sea turtles go there to eat. They spend the first few years of their life drifting around because they don't have the control to swim and uh, and live in these meadows. And then when they do get the control, they head to the meadows. They swim mm. miles and miles and miles to get there. And th- they've used archaeology and ancient samples to work out these are the same habitats in use that sea turtles three thousand years ago have been heading to and it's kind of it's just amazing and the meadows all have their own chemical signatures which end up in the bodies of the sea turtles so yeah yeah. because they're kind of made of these meadows so yeah it's sometimes turtles will visit the same 50 meters squared they have the very specific it's like having a it is like having a table yeah in a particular meadow that they that they return to it's pretty amazing sea turtles um you know conservationists have always been trying to monitor if they're declining you know what's Mm. going on and uh 2023 there was an amazing uh count that happened volunteers went around they found 74,000 nests a bit over that but there's a huge problem that's happening which is that the sex the gender is determined by the climate and as it's getting hotter they tend to be born as female. And so we're slowly losing all male sea turtles. There's yeah. a genuine worry that we're gonna just, we've got all yeah. these women now and no men to sort of. And you need enough diversity in the population yeah. too. That's, that's, it's a, it is a big problem. It's to do with the temperature of the sand, I think. So if the eggs are laid in yeah. sand that's above 31, then they're all female, the mm. units of 31 Celsius. Mm. And if it's below 27, they're all male. And the species relies on the sand being a range of temperatures in between the, you yeah, know, and it, 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 historically it's been well, it'll be colder years and hotter years, so right. we'll get a reasonable number of both. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. the problem. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it is a huge problem. So we're yeah. hoping for an hour. Uh, maybe if you get above like thirty-two, it goes male again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, now we'd be rooting for further global warming <laughs> in order to push through to the the, the really the hot guys, let's call them, um, <laughs> that come to start coming through again. The, well, the other problem is that the seagrass meadows are also hugely yeah. under threat. So, <laughs> just everyone right. in every like yeah. lots of sea turtles. Some sea turtles are doing all right. There is, I think, seven different species of sea turtle, and I think several are endangered. But there are a couple are doing okay. But several are endangered, and the meadows, lots of them are off North Africa, where there isn't much environmental pr- protection, and lots of the countries nearest are go- undergoing quite chaotic times at the moment. And so. Yeah, there is a risk. That Apparently they're... we lose a football pitch's worth of seagrass every 30 minutes. Mm. Jesus. Every right. 30 minutes? Yeah. That's, it's, it's, yeah. I have to say, though, whatever's mowing that seagrass, we want to use that on land because that's really quick. I think it takes more than half an hour to cut the grass on a football pitch. And this is just literally the use of... I mean, using global warming as a force for gardening. Yeah. I mean, it's... Hot turtles, better gardening. Yeah, yeah it's just... <laughs> I kind of like climate change now. (laughs) I'm not for the avoidance of that in favour of climate change. Because the um, seagrass buries carbon 35 times faster than a tropical rainforest, another fact that I read. It's amazing. Yeah, because they just... Seagrass, they take carbon from the water to build their leaves. The leaves eventually die. That sediment stays on the ocean floor for hundreds of years and so that's how they sequester so that's essentially carbon capture it's, it's captured in it's, the it's really silt at the yeah bottom. it's really functional carbon capture and i think 10 percent of the carbon in the ocean is buried by seagrasses or sequestered by seagrasses mm. despite them being 0.1 percent of the ocean floor so it's really we it's need really it. impressive stuff we yeah we need loads more of it can I think, we plant it 
th there are a few plans to plant 18 hectares uh, around the UK by 2026, which is not... It doesn't sound like that's... I don't know how many hectares in a football pitch, but it sounds like a few hours and that's mm. done no good at all. It's not... <laughs> yes, I think they, there might be more like pilot schemes, but they are right. trying to get more going. And, of course, if you protect bits of seafloor, then... You, you did the turtles, the Andy, yeah. did they eat seagrass? They eat the tips of it. I think that stimulates growth. Oh, OK. okay. So, yeah. so we do, there's no cause to, <laughs> to <laughs> eradicate the turtles. Let's just it's check. Be... Just gotta, gotta be open-minded. Maybe the turtles are the villains of the piece. David, for... We're blaming ourselves for all our factories, but maybe those turtles for the listener, are cleverer I... than they look. David's wearing a t-shirt which is saying "Stop Sea Turtles." <laughs> and it's really, it's upsetting. Outside of seagrass, they're quite fussy eaters sea turtles yeah. if they're given a bigger menu to play with um, <laughs> so one of the other problems of um, of the climate at the moment is sometimes they're going off course they're going into colder oceans and they get hypothermia so there's a lot of turtles that that wash oh. up onto shore and either they're dead or they get rescued and taken to turtle hospital where they then get this brilliant menu of different things and so each individual turtle has just a different kind of taste like number seven doesn't like the squid for example <laughs> not interested in squid uh, a few of them don't like tails don't give them any fishy tails or anything like that really? um yeah and also it's creating chaos because turtles are very like, they're very solitary but they're in tanks together to be fed and so there's there's turtle bullies that they have to sort of reprimand and and tell off and so on yeah. because they're eating the, you know the tails and the, and oh the so God. on yeah you can give turtles if they're not very well you can give them mayonnaise oh eat. yes did yeah. you see this so this is if there's been an oil spill and the turtles have eaten a lot of oil. If you give them mayonnaise, it helps them to shit it out. Mm. Uh, and the reason is because obviously mayonnaise is what it's oil and what is it? Whatever it is. Eggs. Yeah, it's an emulsion. <laughs> yeah, you need an emulsion. We're revealing our ignorance here, aren't we? we don't. <laughs> this and it's a really base food stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. It's not complicated. Yeah, no, it's, this isn't off menu. Yeah. We don't need to know anything about <laughs> food. It comes <laughs> out of a jar. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, but it has an emulsifier in it, which mixes <gasps> water and oil. So if you've got oil inside you, the emulsifier inside mayonnaise can help the oil to mix with the water already inside the stomach of the turtle, and then just makes it easier to excrete. That's so interesting. It's cool, That's isn't amazing. It? Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So all these oil slicks are basically they're just a conspiracy by Big Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> that causes massive spikes in the Hellman's share price whenever BP has a little mistake. <laughs> they're suddenly kerching. Um, I've got a link to the previous fact. Weirdly, oh yeah, to the to David's fact, oh, his headline yeah. fact. So seagrasses stop people getting gastroenteritis. Oh. Isn't that good? Hmm. Oh, so good. if you have gastroenteritis it's because you've drunk some water normally, which has the pathogens in it which cause it, seagrass meadows have m m way, way, way fewer of those pathogens in and around and among them. So that water is just cleaner. You're less likely to get gastroenteritis from there. And they've, they've tried to calculate it. It's between 8 and 24 million cases of gastroenteritis prevented every year. Wow. Thanks to that. And I think it's because the seagrass kind of uses it almost like a fertiliser and takes yeah. it into its body. And so exactly. it, cleans, yeah. it takes the gastroenteritis pathogens out of water. Yeah. But can it grow in non-salty water? Ooh. Almost none of it. <laughs> no. No. I think, I think it might be one fresh some, water, but, but no, not much. It's, it's a all. problem there in terms of how useful it is. Well, if you only drink seawater like me, it's, it's actually. <laughs> yeah, that's fine for you. Yeah. Yes, but you know. Yeah. It's still sparkling or salty, I think. But... <laughs> I've just worked out a mnemonic. Oh, yeah. So how many cases did I say it prevented every year? Little quiz, instant recall quiz. How many? How many million <laughs> yeah. cases? I, I, like I think it was a football pitch. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was. It was between eight and twenty-four million cases. Okay. Right? All right. Okay. Now, if you need a mnemonic to remember that. Those are the ages of Matilda and the Holy Roman Emperor when they were betrothed to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need a mnemonic the other way around, you're yeah. like, how oh, was Matilda? Yeah. It was like, oh, what's the lower range of cases yeah. of gastroenteritis prevented Beautiful. each year by seagrasses? Beautiful. So just, so you're, well, you're welcome, no, guys. They don't want to, so 8 and 24 when they were betrothed, <laughs> yeah. but 12 and 28 when they were married. So yeah. not that. No, not that would that. be to massively <laughs> overstate the beneficial effect of seagrass on gastroenteritis. So 
so that's <laughs> I have a thing which I want to link back to the previous fact as well oh, yeah. so we have a mystery butcher of the previous <laughs> fact um, I, I found a mystery turtle that I don't know much more about that I want to find out about and it's the first turtle to uh, go over Niagara Falls in a barrel and survive this was a <laughs> and survive. So you, I'm now conjuring out an image of people glumly looking at a huge pile of dead turtles at the bottom of Niagara Falls and go I don't know maybe try taping an extra under the inside of the barrel. <laughs> well, there was, so this was 1930. There was a guy called George Stathicus, and he had this idea of going over Niagara in a barrel. And um, the barrel goes down. It doesn't break up, but it gets caught in a sort of uh, a, a tide that's underneath. The, I don't know what yeah. you'd call it, but it's he can't escape. And he's there for 18 hours in this <gasps> barrel. So when they find him, oh he's suffocated. What? He's dead. And Sonny oh. is... Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a dead man in the oh. story. Do we suspect the turtle in this story? <laughs> Oh, I haven't thought of that. Like, only one. one of us can survive this. Yeah. Well, the, t- the turtle might have been f- feeling quite negatively towards him, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Yeah. This guy, you know, I'm not, I'm not, wouldn't blame the turtle for not giving him mouth to mouth. <laughs> this is the guy that's, what are we doing now, sir? A <laughs> hundred years old as well. Exactly. That's so a very old turtle. It's a really old turtle. And the barrel is in a museum now. It's held as a kind of piece of Niagara Falls history. Right. But where did Sonny go? No idea. Like the butcher. You know, oh, we don't know what happened to the turtle after that. Someone might know, but I couldn't yeah. find it. Because yeah. they, they, they can live a lot longer than 100 years, can't mm-hmm. they? Because yeah. there wasn't there a turtle... I think I heard this on QI. <laughs> but there was a turtle... Wasn't uh, Clive was a, of India's turtle I died think it's in a tortoise. The, oh, no, I that was a tortoise. Lo- is it Lonesome George? But if George I was American... Or? Yeah, if you were, that if you would were, be a turtle. Yeah. Unfortunately, it? don't yeah. you're the least American person on the planet. <laughs> is that is that a scientific fact? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the least American. Person. <laughs> Let's go another the poster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Dalai Lama is slightly more American than me. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1861, there was one street musician for every 10 streets in London. <laughs> That's <laughs> what a time to be alive. What yeah. a time. Oh, noisy, noisy time. <laughs> Sounds like it was a bit of a bad time for quite a lot of Londoners. Yeah, so this is according to journalist Henry Mayhew, whose um, article admittedly was relatively negative towards the street musicians, but he estimated there are approximately 1,000 street musicians, 10,000. 500 streets okay uh, and it was a real problem we've said before I think that uh, Babbage really hated them he really got yes. frustrated with them and he was actually him and a guy called Michael Bass who ran the Bass Brewery they managed to get it regulated in 1864 but for the probably the decade up until 1864 London was just an unbelievably loud place to live <laughs> largely thanks to these yeah <laughs> and what was their what genre of music did they favour oh it was all sorts <laughs> So Mayhew said there were English violinists, Scottish pipers, German brass bandsmen, Italian grinders, so that'd be like a... You yeah. know, Organs. Organ grinding, grind, yeah. 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 And one French hurdy-gurdy player. Oh. Just, just <laughs> one out of all the th- thousand. <laughs> yeah. She said, oh, here he comes. <laughs> it was a she, Andy. Women can oh, be a hurdy-gurdy I'm sorry, that's, well. my, that's my prejudice there. Um, she had um, an instrument that, according to Mayhew, had a battered, heavy look about it and was grievously harsh and out of tune (laughs) and for 43 years she had her regular rounds 43 yeah so she went to Marleybone on a Monday Kentish Town on a Tuesday Um, so you knew how to avoid it (laughs) exactly you (laughs) still know it's (laughs) Yeah. I saw a hurdy-gurdy player recently. I was in Canterbury, and it's yeah. a very hurdy-gurdy. It was, very, it was the very old, old, old bit of Canterbury, you know, the, mm. the cathedral. So you think he was so a ghost? <laughs> I don't think he was a ghost. <laughs> right. um, no, he ran through a wall as soon as I started asking him questions, but he wasn't a ghost. So it's, um, Can you remind me what... Are you... it's, it, uh, there's a handle, you wind, yeah. and he was doing something with his other hand as well. Oh, and yeah. it looks like a small violin with a handle. Oh, okay. How interesting. It's a re- this is a really bad description. Is it a stringed it instrument? Like. It you... is stringed. Okay, so the fingers are kind of on the frets to sat- like a guitar. This is sounding like the car that Homer Simpson designed. <laughs> it's it's really, some yeah. strings, but also handle, little keyboard on the bottom, and then you blow in the end. 
I can't remember whether this, there were strings and frets or whether there were keys to play. I think it might have been keys and a handle. Right. But it was a co- it was a it's very much a combo thing. Yeah, it was really. Great. I was only nice know guy. it as like a comedy word, really. I know. I was staggered. Yeah. I, like, I saw, I, that's why I said, "What's that?" to this guy, yeah. and he just went. Woo-hoo. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> was, that was the hurdy gurdy making the noise. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, there was uh, one other person just while we're on it, described by Mayhew, who was an Italian fiddler uh, who would go around imitating all the farmyard animals with his fiddle. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. He said he'd been doing it for twelve years and. He could imitate the bull, the calf, the dog, the cock, the peacock, the ass, and the hen when she's laid an egg. Right. That's he amazing. Could do all right. that with his fiddle. But what he couldn't do is play a tune. <laughs> <laughs> And it, what also, he found is that if you just bash at a fiddle, it makes this. <laughs> that is exactly the noise a hen makes when it's just laid. A, you might not be familiar that you live in central London, but if you head out to the countryside and listen to it, it's exactly like that. So isn't that that's worth a pop or two? Isn't it? Um, how how come there was money to support them? Why were they, there must people must have been paying not for much? Penny, yeah, pennies, but it was yeah. like just pennies here Busking, and there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But they were doing it day day in day out, and these people they had their regulars so they would go to Marleybone or to Kentish Town because they knew there was someone there who would give them you know a few halfpennies here and there and right. that's all they needed to live really nice mm. so these um gr- like grinders yeah mm. as they were called and the particular thing that people got annoyed by was people with barrel organs because there was a bit of racism in it because they were mostly from Italy and quite poor and the other thing that annoyed people was you just turn a handle. There's As no in, skill involved. There's no yeah, skill. It's you not buy the skill a, of yeah. making a violin sound like <laughs> no, a, a screech owl. <laughs> like a goat <laughs> yeah. that's been surprised but not badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but just, so, like, you just buy a barrel, slot it into the organ, turn the handle, the same tunes come out every time. Yeah. So, it's a, like, that was a frustrating thing for a lot of people. Mm. So, Charles Dickens's illustrator, called John Leach, claimed that he he died early because... He, he claimed <laughs> You saw him in Canterbury, didn't you, Andy? Yeah. <laughs> he said, this is killing me, and then he died, and he said it's because of this. Yeah. Um, mm. His final words to fellow artist William Frith were, rather Frith to be tormented in this way, I would prefer to go to the grave where there is no noise. There we go. Well, there we go. Oh, he really got on his nerves. So they buried yeah, him yeah. under the bandstand at Clapham Common. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was looking into... What was... What was going on in 1861, London, oh. at the time? Uh, Just curious. Uh, no, as in, I've got the answer. The uh, the invention of the toast sandwich. Because um, <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Beaton's book, A Household Management, was first published, mm. 1861. And one of the recipes in there was toast sandwich. Um, Get yeah. two bits of bread, put your bit of toast inside. I've eaten that, actually. Tried it. Have you? Well, we did mention it on QI once, and I thought, I'll see what it's like. Yeah. yeah. And it's not as bad as you might think, I would mm. say, because it gives you a little bit of texture to what otherwise is quite boring piece of bread. So it's bread toast bread. Yeah. Well, people put crisps in sandwiches, yeah. don't they, for a bit of crunch. Yeah. But there's usually Somewhere. something else. <laughs> yeah. Although I think actually a sandwich of just butter and crisps, I mean... Flavour of yeah. choice? I mean... Oh, I'm ready salted. Oh, ready salted. Way, yeah. I think yeah, that's yeah. probably right with that combo. I think, yeah. yeah, salt and vinegar wouldn't quite. Miss. It's a lot more about texture than taste. Mm. But, um, yeah, mm. but you still think you might a little bit of something else. I think yeah. there was butter on it All in right. Mrs. Beaton's version. Was that? Yes, yeah, yeah. So that was invented in. That was well, the book was published, and that right. was uh, that was a very notable notable very yes, odd huge. bit of recipe. Yeah. Uh, black velvet. You might have seen people walking around the streets, 1861, drinking black velvet. Oh, oh. Now, this is a, a, a Guinness with a glass of champagne. In it. That's right. Is it yeah. really? Yeah. And that's nice. from then? Yes, to yeah. commemorate wow. a very big death Ooh. of 1861. Albert? That's right. Nice. Albert died December 1861. And he invented a cocktail. Just before. <laughs> just, no, 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 no. He said, this cocktail's going to yeah. kill me. Yeah. And then he died. <laughs> and then he and said, that's what they told you. Uh, no, well, but, can you think why they might have invented the cocktail? What, uh, what? I mean, to try and monetize it, I suppose, <laughs> yeah, in yeah. general. That, you know. uh, is it black for mourning? Yep. Yeah. So, and then champagne for a royal celebration. A royal so death. the Guinness would sit like a black band, like mourners were oh. wearing around their arms. The idea was that it was a... It's That's like getting a top on your beer. Is uh, that a lager top? Is that what... Which... For, what is a lager top? It's a normal pint of lager, but they pour out the tiniest bit at the top and they give you a little dash of lemonade just to take the edge off. So it's like a very, very strong shandy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You, when your shandies become a lager top, you know, you're, you're, you're just telling yourself, that's just beer, mate. And particularly when you say, and instead of the beer, use whiskey. <laughs> uh, just two more things, because yeah. it's quite fun to know. Uh, 
it was the publication of Great Expectations. So Dickens okay. obviously had been printing the stories in serials, but it was the first full book bringing the chapters together. And then the last one that I found was, it was the introduction of Widow Twenky into pantomime. Oh, wow. Yeah, 1861, the first ever it Sounds like quite performed. a good time to be alive. I know, it's yeah. great. And the music. Yeah. Have you guys heard, just on people being loud and other people oh, being yeah. annoyed about that, have you heard of the New York Society for the Suppression of Unnecessary Noise? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is my kind of organisation, basically. And yet you said David Mitchell is not very American. <laughs> 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 so this was a doctor called Julia Barnett Rice. Okay, she was, uh, she qualified in 1885, got a medical degree but didn't practice. Uh, I think, don't know if women were allowed to practice in the 1880s, 90s. I'm not sure. Um, but she... Um, she really wanted that street vendors not be allowed to shout. And she, like, she made it her life's mm. course. And she and her husband, he was called Isaac Rice. He uh, was an interesting guy in various ways. He invented a chess opening that was called the Rice Gambit. Hmm. Just Brilliant. so you know. Yeah. And, and then spent about, apparently, the next 20 years of his life researching, analysing and testing the soundness of his gambit. <laughs> So That's great. what a thing to spend your life yeah, doing! Yeah. But they and they. But they, the thing is that I've never heard of that, and I follow chess a little bit. Uh, so presumably, it wasn't very useful after I all those twenty not. years. No, he got to <laughs> the end of the twenty years, like, yeah. oh, it's not allowed to move that way. Oh, <laughs> cancel that. <one. laughs> I have never in my life met a bishop that could only move diagonally. It's just not realistic. Whereas castles can't move at all without an earthquake. And they just, they had, they had a house on Broadway, way too noisy. So they yeah. moved up to by the river, right? On Riverside Drive. Mm. They built their own house, had a basement vault dug so that they could have somewhere quiet. Partly because, wow. partly because they had six children. So the house was quite okay. noisy. Yeah. So he stayed in the basement a lot of the time doing his gambit. <laughs> <laughs> as, as he called it. <laughs> That's actually what the rice gambit is, isn't it? <laughs> and because they were by the river, the riverboats made so much noise oh blowing no. their horns all day. So she, uh, Julia, she hired students to count the number of toots per day. Uh -huh. And it was about a thousand toots per day. But if it was foggy, it was 3,000. Yeah. So she started a campaign saying, look, this is very bad for people's health. Mm. Particularly, and it was mostly because she didn't like yeah. it as far as I can tell uh, yeah. and, but the tugboat captains found out about this campaign of hers and they found out where she lived and they would gather outside oh, on the river no. at night and all blast their horns oh, no. but she genuinely got the law changed and she got yeah. Mark Twain involved wow. and she, like, she established quiet zones around hospitals how many boats sank then countless <laughs> 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 shipwrecks <laughs> tragically but very quiet ones that was yeah. the key Yeah, that's amazing another uh, person who hated it was Thomas Carlyle just to go back to the um, 1850s in London in the 1850s and 1860s in London um, he once wrote that he was considering to assassinate a vile Italian organ grinder who worked near his house but I think he might have built the first ever soundproof room uh, oh, wow. in his house in London this was in 1853 it had double walls and it had a slated roof with a gap in between where he could get like muffling chambers full of air so the, the sound couldn't get in mm. and it cost him £170 which according to one online calculator I found said it was about £30,000 today it cost him for a house extension that's you know yeah in those days and yeah though, I think yeah why didn't they pay the, the annoying organ grinder to go away Oh, you could, I think you could do that. Yeah, I but think then, that is how they earned a quite a bit of their money, just extorting it from people. That's, so. That must be a, that's a glum profession, though. Yeah. You know, ostensibly you're there yeah. to, you know, we're here to entertain with our, our violin that sounds like a cow. And you go, actually, no, but the real, the real money is the people who desperately want you to go. It would be if we went doing live shows like we do and we got on stage and everyone had done a whip round for us not to do the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to give you one last set of buskers. Yeah. This is yeah. in 2009 in uh, Birmingham. Two buskers who only knew two songs and had been playing them in the same part of Birmingham for 18 months on end <laughs> were given asbos. <laughs> and uh, they were. Uh, they, knew, they knew Wonderwall that's, and George that's Michael's. the worst review. <laughs> go, five star, four star, three star, two star, one star, and then uh, there is asbo. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was Wonderwall and Faith. Um, they had a guitar uh, and they had a bin lid. And Yeah, but they were playing God. it to like four or five or six in the morning sometimes okay. and one person said to be fair they didn't do a bad rendition of the songs <laughs> so that's but then you, they would if you lived in the area that would become the main version of the song to you and then you listen to Oasis going, and go, no they've got that bit wrong <laughs>
There's a few it. classic London ones I think most tourists will probably remember if they've got the tube, like the uh, Henry the Hoover. What is that a person in a Henry the Hoover costume? No, there was a guy, I think, next to it on a keyboard, but then he had, accompanied by this Henry the Hoover that had the saxophone that would shoot bubbles outside. Yeah. So, sorry, is the where's the saxophone? In the nozzle, I guess. Of the Hoover? Yeah, but wait, sucks, the far sorry. end of the nozzle, like the, the bit that does the hoovering, or is it a right... Is that, is that, have you removed the hoover's trunk? I can't believe you have the saxophone Quickly, that. what I thought was a solid image in my head has collapsed <laughs> immediately. <laughs> It sounds great. I just, made that I just want yeah. a bit of doctrinal reassurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Good. you suck a saxophone, does it make the same noise as if you blow a saxophone? It, wow, great question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm might assuming do. not. <laughs> you would think not, <laughs> would you? Yeah. Because you're know. sucking it into the... Is it the horn? The mouth of the saxophone? The bell end, actually. Is it called the bell yeah, end? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it presumably will make the, the opposite <laughs> the opposite noise. Does it always have an opposite? Well, <laughs> we're now into quite what, what's theological. What's the opposite noise to February? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Andy. I mean, <laughs> no, I like this. Yeah, I like the big. We're finally getting to the big yeah. questions. <laughs> Five hundred eps in, finally. Does the noise have an opposite? Does noise you can have, have an opposite wave function. Well, they can do oh, things, can't oh. they, sometimes when if there's a noise of air conditioning when you're recording yeah. something, they can record that and in some way Inver- uh, an, an invert inverted, it. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it sucks that noise out. So if you're okay. at home and you know what the opposite of the word February is, yeah, it's, send it it's in. It's the noise that you would play <laughs> over the word February in order to induce silence. <laughs> and all these uh, irritable Victorians needed was to have that on their own uh, barrel organ. <laughs> And turn the handle and it would go quiet. That would be amazing. The opposite of Wonderwall. (laughs) Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everybody. Just to let you know, we are sponsored this week by ExpressVPN. Absolutely. ExpressVPN, it's the place to go if you want to add a little widget to your computer or phone, which will stop someone this Halloween season from putting their eyes on you. (laughs) That's right. It's spooky season, and it's a season for being observed surreptitiously from the corner of the room by a spider or a ghoul. (laughs) Or by powerful government agency. No, sorry, I'm going going into CIA territory there. Uh, And if you're listening, guys, hello. The point is, your internet service provider can track your activity online, and ExpressVPN allows you to reroute your activity through encrypted servers to protect your privacy online. Yes, absolutely. Another thing that VPNs are useful for is you can access material that you might not be able to get in your country. So, for instance, when I was in Montenegro, I could watch the England football game game using my express vpn mm. so it's not just about hiding from gchq <laughs> <laughs> it's all sorts and right now you can get three extra months of express vpn for free by going to express vpn that's letters vpn.com slash fish that's right just go to express vpn.com slash fish to learn more and to get your extra three months for free up with the podcast <laughs> Okay, it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact is that in 1993, a man in Brazil who robbed a factory of its glue was arrested 36 hours later, still in the factory he was robbing, because he was stuck to the glue he was stealing. Didn't he think to steal the glue in its containers? I think what happened, so this is a guy called Edelberg. He was just putting it in his I'll pocket. Take, I'll, take, I'll just take the glue loose. It's, it's, not, it's so heavy, these cans. Because the, the police will be looking for tubes of glue. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. won't be looking for raw glue. <laughs> and so this is a, it was a 19-year-old. He was called Edelberg Guamares. We don't have to name him. Yeah. For what's the, what's, what's the opposite of that noise? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think he was probably called Edilberto. Because I googled it and I can't find anyone else called Edilbert, but there's a lot of people called Edilberto where it runs over two lines and there's a hyphen. Oh, and right. Oh, so that's interesting. So. 
So yeah, I saw, so I saw the story in the Washington Post. It was part of a yearly roundup, and it was a 19-year-old, and uh, he did take two large cans, and since something must have happened, they tipped over as he was trying to get out of the factory. <sighs> glue spilled everywhere. He obviously tried to pick up the glue, put it back in, I don't know, <laughs> and then got stuck to where he was. It is very easy. To, I had to gl- do a minor glue job the other day, and the amount of glue on my hands at the end of it was... Incredible. When you say glue job, is that like a bank job? Were you also stealing glue? No, um... <laughs> Yeah, it's just very, it's very easy, even with a Does small. Does it dry that tube. quickly? Oh god, yeah. it dries so fast, no, and it's really. yeah. This yeah, is, sorry, no. this is now my personal no, glue, glue is very very annoying because it, it either doesn't work, like you know, essentially Pritt stick. Yeah. Well, there are other brands of glue that don't work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they sort of go and that's okay, it sort of sticks it a bit, but you know, so does snot. Uh, or it's just so incredibly effective, yeah. and you can't be angry with it, can you? Because, you know, yes, it's doing exactly what, yes. what, what, what yes, I wanted it to stick things together. And, but yeah, I didn't say my fingers. But yes, I did apply my two fingers to each other yeah. while there was glue on one. And now, you know, but it's like it's, the glue is being facetious. You yeah. know, I didn't want to stick my fingers whenever. <laughs> has anyone wanted to stick their fingers together yeah yeah i didn't i it was through researching this fact that i didn't realize how important super glue is to the world of live music oh for live shows so take a band like the red hot chili peppers flea on the bass very aggressive with his playing slapping and popping and all sorts and he'll get huge calluses during the mm. gig and sometimes with old wounds that he's got they'll be ripped open so he's got <gasps> missing bits of his hand so he'll run off stage grab super glue fill in the hole oh no yeah yeah and come back on john frusciante does it the guitarist of the red hot chili peppers yeah. stevie ray vaughan does it there's so many musicians that talk they've about they've got to give it a minute or they're gonna stick to their instruments <laughs> 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 I do. I know. I have someone else who glued them, uh, glued their fingers together. Actually, oh yeah, for a specific use in film. A Is it something we can guess? Oh, okay. It's something you can guess. Oh, okay. glued their. Ooh, yeah, I know it. So I won't say it. Oh, I, great yeah. shout. Here's the only thing I'd say is as like an additional clue. I can't do this. So I, if I was in the movie as this character, yeah. I would require the super glue well, as well. I'm thinking of one of two things. Okay. Is it E. T. Oh, the yeah, weird fingers. That's good. <laughs> or or Spock. It's Spock. It's Spock. It's Spock. Well, he couldn't it, do it without glue. Mr. Uh, Z- Spock, it was Zachary, Zach, yeah. Zachary Quinto in the new Star Trek film, couldn't do the Vulcan salute. So they glued his fingers Which together. Which I can't do. I, can't. I, can, I can do it with one hand, but not with the other. Right. Would you feel, <laughs> if for that reason you weren't cast as Spock in Star Trek, would you feel that that was okay? I think so. Uh, yeah. Or would such... you feel you were being discriminated against? Well, he, he wasn't discriminated against. No. I don't know if but... he showed up to the audition pre-glued. <laughs> I would I... say, if I was auditioning for Spock, first thing, can you do that with your hand? Yeah. If so, okay, let's look at the script. <laughs> well, that, yeah. <laughs> In fairness, they don't only cast people with pointy ears, so yeah. they do add some kind of... Having said that, though, if some people had pointy ears, they would have a legitimate <laughs> grievance. I mean, talk about... If there were real Vulcans yeah. among us, <laughs> and then suddenly we're getting people to Vulcan up yeah, then no, that's, that's, that's not appropriate awful. is no. it but because Vulcans don't happen to exist it's okay to point a ear up non-Vulcans yeah. but the similarly the hand thing I do oh. feel like Zachary Quinto is taking jobs away from people like me who can do yeah, exactly. you can do it can, really dead easy with both do it. Yeah. you two can I can do it with one and yeah. just about with the other and you can't do it at all I can't do it at yeah. all no <laughs> well you can play Kirk <laughs> 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 There's plenty of parts. <laughs> was was William Shatner Kirk? Yeah, yeah. So he couldn't yeah. do it either, and they tied well, his great. Fi- they, no, no. But he, apparently, he has to do it at one point. They oh, tied right. his fingers together with fishing line. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, my God. that makes sense. That's really cool. I'm very I'm glad. It's lovely you say I'm the least American person, but you are, was William Shatner Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I I really knew that as a piece of popular culture. <laughs> got through to me. Uh, Was Elvis Presley a singer? <laughs> um, speaking of body parts and glue, do you know what butt glue is? Ooh, butt, butt glue. glue. Butt glue. I have a product at home called Butt Clean, but it's <laughs> it's for my. Wa- I have a water butt. 
So right. you must have been yeah. disappointed when you bought that off the I, internet. I certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> the amount of capsules I wasted before <laughs> realising they had to be just dropped in the water butt. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so it cleans a water butt then. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You just pop it in and it fizzes a bit. It's kind all of all like, the what? turtles just float to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this uh, is actually more to do with the American. So what's it called? Butt fingers. Butt, butt glue. Is it for a <laughs> butt fingers? Is it that's a terrible Bond remake. <laughs> <laughs> butt fingers. Um, butt glue. But so, but that's okay. not for it's not for repairing water butts. No, it's not. It's <laughs> for the bottoms, and it's for Bottom. people who compete in pageants. Hmm. Uh, if you're wearing a very tight bikini, you want it to be exactly straight on your cheeks. You don't want it to oh. ride up or anything like that. You put it between the bikini and the and the so bottom. So it sort of goes on the bikini to get it positioned. But so I was thinking it goes on the bum, but it it sort of lifts the bum. Well, Andrew, <laughs> oh, no. you would be good in the um, in the pageant world according to the Bravo I, show I think that as well I'm, I'm amazed that is his line of work you, you would be an innovator because according to the Bravo show Game of Crowns uh, which is quite recent some people are using butt glue to actually hold the butt cheeks together um, to kind of oh, make yeah. them seem very pert um, because it's not very strongly but it's water right. soluble so you can put oh. some water down there and it'll open them up again but so that, you just need a you just yeah. Oh, thank goodness. So do not use super glue instead of butt glue. You're doing your air fix with butt glue. It's not like, oh my God. Is that a common complaint in beauty pageant terms that the buttocks are too far, they want them to be far, far, far apart? Possibly. That's a sign of a criminal disposition. I don't the think they all do this, apart, you know? just to say, if you're a beauty pageant the Of course person, not. No, yeah. no, no, of course not. I think, not. but just some that. people do it too. God. But I thought there was glue. There's all sorts of bits of glue for sticking mm. bits of makeup to people's faces mm. surely this is the same as butt glue there's no need to say that this glue yeah is, it's skin glue it doesn't need to be specifically for the butt i think there might be some marketing going on there like i have something called nerd wax which you use to keep your sunglasses on <laughs> right um because my nose is quite small so my sunglasses slip down my nose and you can oh. kind of put it on your nose and it kind of keeps it there but really, it's just wax. But they've yeah. put it in a nice tube that says Nerd Wax on, and it made me want to buy it. Mm. So I think it's a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. butt glue, you could use it wherever you like. Booger glue. Anyone heard of booger glue? Okay, uh, booger as in the American sauce. Yeah, sorry, I should explain what booger yeah. is to the yeah, non-American here. <laughs> um, the, no, I've heard, I've heard the expression <laughs> despite being so un-American, as in for a, for a, it's for a unit of snot, isn't it? A unit of dry oh, yeah. snot. A like bo a bogey. Like a bogey. Oh, yeah. Bogey. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. yeah. Is it used it. in beauty pageants to hold the nostrils together because <laughs> yeah. it's considered to be yeah. more beautiful? <laughs> Too far apart nostrils. It's the... Uh, Remember when uh, you used to get a card, bank card, through the post, and when you would take it oh, off, there would be a little bit of glue yeah. underneath. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a very clever. snotty booger glue. Booger that's booger glue. Huh. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. That's satisfying though, because when that comes away, it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> completely. Which is actually not the case for snot. Mm. I'd say snot leaves mm. more of a sort of residue. <laughs> Better than snot. Better than snot. We've invented a better snot. But <laughs> now all we need to do is get it to somehow come out of our noses. <laughs> <laughs> because at the moment it only manifests on credit cards yes. rather than in handkerchiefs <laughs> when you've got a cold. Come on, AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to wrap us up in a sec. Oh, should um, we do some bungling criminals? Yeah, why not a couple oh, yeah. of bungling criminals? Um, there was a man who so stole a parcel from Reading. Um, <laughs> was it to contain <laughs> Henry I? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is in 1994. It was in the, the early 90s. So it fits. Yeah, yeah, that was after he died. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it turned out to be a bomb. Oh, it turned out oh to be no. an IRA bomb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he ran down the road, pointing to the suitcase that he'd stolen, shouting, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. Uh, and passers-by thought that he was high on drugs, but he dumped the suitcase outside a shop and 200 homes in Reading had to be evacuated while the oh, bomb squad God. made it safe. I thought you were going to say blew up. No. <laughs> right, no, no, no. Okay. I'll okay. <laughs> tell you what, I'll safely put it outside a shop. <laughs> I'll be honest, I, just, I think he was panicking. Yeah, How did he... Because there, there must have been a... There's a moment of realisation in that story, He's isn't there? Suitcase. He's stolen the suitcase. It's labelled IRA. <laughs> <laughs> it's ticking or there's a fuse or something. The, the truth is, like, you would think it probably wasn't a bomb, right? But they did, you know, they did make it safe. So the newspaper report did say that it was a bomb. Yeah, OK. Yeah, right. could have been. Uh, a hero butcher. You want to hear about a hero butcher? Oh, yeah. We've already had yeah. what, another one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> this was um, a man who stole six pounds from a butcher, uh, but the butcher was also an amateur magician. <laughs> and rather than raising the alarm because he thought the guy would run away if he said stop thief, he decided to do a trick where he pretended that 50p had gone missing. And he said, oh, let me find it. It might be about your person. And he searched the person and found the six pounds that he'd stolen. Uh, and yeah. That's brilliant. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, this is in 1976. How did he? Yeah, people were more willing to stand still then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When the, the butcher <laughs> suddenly, I, you know, I have just stolen six pounds, and now the butcher is coming round the counter and doing a bit of a trick <laughs> about coin. <laughs> this, this is an eerie. And how coincidence. can the butcher prove unless the butcher has already written his initials on the six pounds, which he might have done as part of the magic trick? <laughs> <laughs> Just Maybe. say that's my six pounds. What are you going to do? Yeah, Maybe it was a coincidence that the butcher always basically stole all the money of the people who came in. But on this occasion, it was just money that, you know, he was nicking back. The reason we know about it is because actually the butcher let the guy go and even gave him some sausages for his tea uh, because he could see that he was in need of this stuff. That's really nice. Um, but that when the guy was caught for a different robbery, uh, he was in court in Newcastle and he asked for this and a few other crimes to be taken into account and then they brought the butcher in to corroborate it so that's oh, how we know it happened right cool. why did he mention that when he was d- being done for something else when <laughs> the butcher oh, yeah. wasn't taking it any further and it said fine have some sausages guess how I got these good, sausages good good it's a funny story actually <laughs> it, it took, I'll tell you what you sh- I should tell you yeah. <laughs> you know what I did think that but it yeah. is a thing that they asked for other things to be taken into account don't but, they but that I think is what they're saying is it, it precludes future prosecution I think that might them. be it yes <gasps> But I think on this, so I suppose maybe. But on this, there's no way the butcher's going to go. Actually, I've thought about it. <laughs> that was out of order, and I want the sausage back. Do you think it might make the judge look more kindly on you to say, "All right, I've turned over a new leaf." By the way, here are some other things. Right? Like yeah. It. I don't well, know. Maybe. I think if you said to the judge, "I've never done anything wrong before," that's fine. But the difference between saying talking about five previous robberies <laughs> rather than four, I don't think that's going to yeah. meaningfully change the judge's view. On I you. think it. Because it's such a funny story. The judge must get a lot of quite grim cases of theft and, and burglary yeah. and stuff. And actually, this funny thing that happened in a butcher's shop would make yeah. me look more kindly on a crook. Like, now, yeah. now I know you're a bungling crook. Bungling <laughs> <laughs> so you go, and then the butcher, anyway, the butcher saw the funny side, gave me some sausage. <clears throat> yeah, and then I, I mugged an old lady. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And David. At Real D. Mitchell. Nice. Uh, Uh, But I don't actually look at any of the replies because it's so poisonous on there. (laughs) Yes. So, you know, you won't won't be hearing back from me. I've been tweeting you abuse for years. (laughs) You mean you haven't been reading? I'm well aware. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there, so do check them out. But most importantly of all, get David's new book. It's called Unruly A History of England's Kings and Queens. It's out now in all shops and online. Uh, that's it for us. We'll be back again next week, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.